As we come to you live this morning, we're going to start with the great unknown of what is ahead for abortion rights in Michigan after the overturn of Roe v. Wade. I'm very happy to have with me this morning the Attorney General for the state of Michigan, Dana Nessel. Attorney General, it's good to have you with me this morning. You've been very clear about your positions on abortion and your dismay with the decision. But right now, due to a court injunction, abortion remains legal in Michigan. But this feels very hour by hour, depending on court decisions, right? Yeah, that's definitely true. But I think it should be clear to everyone because I know that some of the healthcare systems, hospital systems have um, displayed some uncertainty when it comes to what the law is yeah. as of right now. And the law is that the 1931 law cannot be enforced until or unless uh, a, a court of law lifts that stay that's in place right now. So as of right now, abortion remains legal exactly as it was before the Dobbs decision came down. Um, but of course, we don't know what will happen in the future. Yeah, now there are two suits right now in play. I'll get to the governors in a moment, but first the suit that carries this injunction is actually Planned Parenthood versus the Attorney General of the state of Michigan. That's you, even though you are aligned with Planned Parenthood and their aims. But it points out an interesting conundrum. As AG, aren't you duty bound to defend the laws of the state, whatever they may be? Well, I believe that generally speaking, that's true. But, you know, I made it very clear to the voters of the state of Michigan back in 2018 that I believed that this law was unconstitutional, both under, under federal law and state law, and in accordance with the Michigan Constitution. So I said, if this day ever came to pass, I would not defend this law. So what I did instead is I invited the Republicans in the legislature who do believe that this is a valid law to defend this law. Now, I over and over and over again, I emailed them, I called them, I asked, are you going to intervene? Remember, not only do the Republicans in the legislature intervene in my cases all the time, even when I am vigorously defending them, uh, but they had set aside $750,000 just in the event that they wanted to participate in this lawsuit. So they had every opportunity from the first day it was filed in order to defend this. For me, I felt as though I could not in good conscience defend a law that I believe violates the rights of the 2.2 million women of reproductive age in this state, and that certainly would cause grave, you know, injury, uh, you know, bodily harm, or even death to those women. I could not defend such a law, so I invited the legislature to defend it instead. We, we, we have at least seven county prosecutors saying they won't prosecute abortions, but can we have prosecutors wildcatting around the laws that are on the books either? In fact, this door swings both ways. There are 12, I think at least 12 candidates for sheriff right now in the state of Colorado saying they will refuse to enforce um, uh, red flag laws. So uh, this is kind of becoming a wild west of people deciding what laws they want to uh, prosecute and uh, observe and the ones they don't. Well, let me say a few things. First of all, this is a law that had been rendered unenforceable for half a century in our state. Yeah. Um, so this is not just any law in the world, right? This is a law that will have grave impact upon the people of our state and the bodily integrity of the women who live here. Um, but that being the case, of course, there's always prosecutorial discretion. And that's why it's important to pay attention to the positions of the people running for things like sheriff or running for things like attorney general. For instance, I have a wildly different views of what the priorities of my office are and how my resources should be spent. So prior to me being in office, the hate crimes law was never enforced by my Republican predecessors. The payroll fraud laws were never enforced. Mm. Environmental laws were rarely enforced. Domestic terrorist laws were never charged at all, ever. I have charged all of those laws. Uh, and I've, I've de-emphasized all of the prosecutions rela related to marijuana cases. And I've put that money into large, um, you know, institutional sexual assault cases like, you know, MSU, like, uh, the clergy abuse cases that we've charged, uh, like the Boy Scouts of America cases that involve sexual assault. So every prosecutor has prosecutorial discretion. I'm choosing not to use the resources of my office uh, to prosecute healthcare providers 
uh, and women for uh, a procedure that's been, you know, leaf lawfully available in this state and in this country well, for 50 years. So let me ask this then. Abortion is not nearly as black and white sometimes as it shows up in the headlines. Most Americans, even a higher majority of Michiganders, support Roe v. Wade, but most Americans also favor some kind of limit. If a woman wanted an abortion at, say, 35 weeks and her life wasn't in danger, are you okay with that? You know, the only time in my life that I have ever seen those late third trimester abortions is when there is something horrifically wrong mm. where you have a situation where either the woman's life is in jeopardy or you have such significant fetal abnormalities that that child will never ever be able to live outside the womb. Those are the only cases. And so for people to talk about it as though that happens all the time, and these are just people who decided to wait until the last minute, I don't know any doctors that would perform those procedures unless, like I said, those two uh, sets of circumstances exist. And these are people who desperately want those children, but there, something went terribly wrong during the pregnancy. Sure, but Roe versus Wade at least seemed to attach to it the idea of viability, which I guess if we wiped off the 1931 law, we wouldn't really even have sort of that guideline in Michigan, would we? No, it would mean that even when there were these you know, serious health complications, uh, a woman would not be able to obtain an abortion. And that's what makes it so incredibly scary. Uh, you were, uh, I was with you uh, in Washington. You were a part of the team that won gay marriage rights at the Supreme Court. In fact, you even uh, now famously proposed to your wife in front of the Supreme Court after the decision. Uh, Justice Alito took pains in his writing saying no other rights are being addressed in this decision, but Justice Thomas uh, clearly sees it differently. Do you feel like the legal status of your marriage and so many others is right now in jeopardy? I 100% I believe that, and here's why. First of all, that was only a 5-4 decision, right? It wasn't a 9-0 decision. The makeup of the court has now changed substantially. I truly believe that you have six justices, at least five, but possibly six, who would be willing to overturn Obergefell. And I think it's important for people to know the justices don't bring these cases, right? So anyone at any time in any state could bring such a challenge. And especially if there's a split in the circuits, uh, I do believe that this will end up before the Supreme Court again. And I believe that what Judge uh, Justice Thomas said in his uh, concurring opinion was a basically a call to arms for those that want to challenge not just you know same-sex marriage, but the legal availability of contraception uh, in accordance to the Lawrence decision, which basically governs what kind of uh, sex acts people can have in private with their you know, consenting adult spouse. So all of these that have been longtime seminal cases that we've known to be the law of this land for many, many years could suddenly be overturned uh, at the invitation of Justice Thomas. And I believe that with this makeup of the court, they are prepared to address all of these cases and they are prepared to overturn all of these cases. Well, we are certainly on a frontier right now. Dana Nessel, I so appreciate you joining me live on this Sunday morning. I know we will be having many further conversations as we head down this road. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me.